Hi there, I'm Sifu Slim, and this is a three-part series, and I'm here with Sifu Mike, and we're going to talk today about head injuries in the brain and how young people often, because of coaching and just because of young people are, are wired, they want to perform, they want to impress, and they have that uh, idea of being invincible and bulletproof, which uh, even I had, uh, your favorite uh, commentator, Sifu Slim, thought he was invincible. He didn't realize he was a stick among mastodons like this guy when he was a little guy careening into the football game. Like, why can't, why can't I careen into these bigger guys? But I, I learned little by little that I don't do very well careening into people unless I hit them the perfect way, whereas you could probably hit people five ways and still make out okay when you were a kid. Yeah. Impervious. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think my brain uh, was located in different areas of my body. <laughs> so uh, the first part is called doing the right thing for the brain. And what prompted this is, is in 2019, um, a boxer by the name of Day, I can't think of his first name right now, but he was well liked. He came from a family that was on the educated side. Good-looking guy, well-liked, even the other fighters liked him. I mean, and he, he looks completely in shape. You, you look at him and he looks like, you know, the best of the MMA fighters. Great musculature, great ability. But he got hit in a fight uh, within the last two weeks, and it was uh, the concussion followed by concussion, and then one more on the way down in his boxing match. And you could think that he was hit by these punches over the course of his life many times, but the way he got hit and the angles and the rotational force in this particular fight and whatever was going on with his pre-existing conditions in the brain, which we have no idea, of, no way of knowing, uh, it killed him. And so, uh, and the other fighter who, you know, was the, the one who won that fight, he said he wished he could do anything to change that outcome. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard stories of this over the course of of your life uh, well, following the media on sports. Well, yeah, I mean, um, this is actually, there, there's, there's a current movement, even in MMA, to eliminate the gloves in general, because there's this false sense of security that um, I'm wearing gloves, therefore it's a little bit more humane. But what happens, specifically in boxing and kickboxing, is the, 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 the person, the fighters in there are taking one blow after another blow after another blow, even in their sparring session, wearing the, wearing the headgear isn't protecting you enough, but because you're wearing this extra protection, you believe you can hang in there a, a little bit longer. And then you have these rule sets that manifested itself in the late 19th century, where we're going, where we go, okay, well, we're going to give the, 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 the fighter a chance to recover, and we're going to give the, uh, the, the, the fighter a one minute break between uh, a three minute round so that you can come in and get hit again over and over. And then you know, back in the days um, where, where uh, people felt like they had to get into wars before actually getting into the ring or getting into the, the Spartans cages. took themselves into, uh, almost destroyed themselves before they got ready for war. Right, right. So a lot of people don't, don't understand. Yes, you're, you're getting ready for war mentally, but how many times do you have to keep taking those blows over and over and over again? Your body knows what to do. Eventually, your body just shuts down going in. This is this has happened to many fighters um, uh, over the years where they've had really solid chins, but all of a sudden the, the body uh, realizes that if it shuts itself down, then it will stop taking blows. Um, that's complete hypothetical for me. That's that's my firm belief that um, hasn't been hasn't been proved uh, is not a proven theory in any it, way it shape or form. It seems to make sense. It, based it makes on the survival of human species. Yeah, if you, if uh, think about it if if a person is taking one blow after another blow after another blow and your body is receiving this and then all of a sudden you go night night one day. Um, and then the next time you get hit, you go night night again. That's yeah. your body basically saying, "I'm we're done." Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, the, uh, there's a new movement. They ha they have they now have a uh, bare knuckle boxing, okay, and um, sanctioned fights. Sanctioned fights, yeah, absolutely sanctioned fights. And so, do a number of states uh, authorize that and license it? I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea. I believe they were being held in Salt Lake City, Utah, but I'm not ent entirely sure. I just usually just watched it, um, uh, and the the people who are doing fairly well in there right now are MMA fighters, um, and. You know, I, it's 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 one of those things where I try to explain to people like why um, boxers fight a certain way because um, with the advent of, of the of the gloves, 
it allowed you to 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 fight a certain way keeping yourself covered makes makes sense yeah. but without gloves keeping yourself covered doesn't make any sense it doesn't cover very enough much of your, territory right yeah. you mean you can come in here but you're also also preventing your your, your ability to see yeah. your yeah. opponent hitting you there's a lot of surface area in a heavyweight boxing glove the six, if you went for okay. 16 ounce gloves yeah. that's well, yeah, that's but uh, the, the, the professionals, they wear 10-ounce ta gloves in the actual ring. The, the, the heavyweights, you sure they're not doing 12-ounce gloves? Could be 12-ounce. Yeah. Last time I checked, it was 10-ounce. And the practice, are they using bigger? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like absolutely. 16? But, again, yeah. you're still getting hit. Your, your, your head is still get, uh, getting yeah. a jar. And even in kickboxing, you know, the shin guards aren't, aren't there to protect the person's head. The shin guards are there to protect the person's shin. Yeah. Yeah. So you're getting hit full force with, with kicks. And then every once in a while during practice, you're going to zig when, you're gonna, when, when you should have zag. Um, most modern MMA practices now are very much not a lot of hard hitting. Just we're going to keep it what light. Have you seen the change in the training of the uh, boxing and MMA in the last five years mostly? Ten years. Not less last ten, ten years. years. It started, there, there started to be a gradual mo a motion. Uh, um, ten years ago, everybody was going hard, um, going hard. Um, but then some of the successful um, uh, fight teams started to come out, and they started to find out that they, they didn't have as many wars. Um, some of the most notable hard-hitting um, teams were like uh, Shooter Box from uh, Brazil. Uh, they were very well known of, of just like killing each other. Thai boxing also used to be that way, right? Yeah. yeah During yeah. Bruce Lee's era. I read that they brought some Thai boxers to where Bruce was, and these guys were like jungle people that just blasted each other all the time. And Bruce was an incredible martial artist, but according to people I've talked to who knew him and uh, were very close to him, they said he didn't like to be hit. And I don't like to be hit, and Bruce is kind of a smaller version of me, a thin guy. A good, he was a very good-looking guy, and he liked to block him, but he didn't want to stand there with these Thai boxers and get whacked over the course of an hour. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, you, you, mentioned, it, you mentioned it earlier. Um, my first three or four uh, kickboxing match, I approached it in the Muay Thai sense. It's just, I'm going to go forward, I'm, not, I'm, going to, I'm going to cover a little bit, I'm going to take the blows, but then I'm going to hit them harder. Hmm. Um, by the time my fifth kickboxing match uh, came up, I'm like, you know what, I, d I don't want to get hit. How old um, were you? Twenties. Ah, uh, my my fifth uh, kickboxing match. That was about twenty five, twenty six. So you're starting to get some sense by <laughs> twenty five. <laughs> no, just start. You know, start moving the head. And you'd already done military. You had yeah. already done football, judo, lots of pretty hardcore sports. But yeah. about twenty five, you, you have no idea why the light flipped at that point. Um, I have no idea what was going on through my head at, at the time. I also also doing full contact uh, 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 karate tournaments. Um, where you could go full force to the body and kick the head. Were most of your coaches over that time, let's say from age 15 to 25, on the aggressive push it, take take your 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 blows my, and keep on coming? My type? first, yeah, no, my first Chinese um, martial art uh, instructor, Sifu, he wasn't much into into taking hits. He would he would always want me to move out of the way or block. Um, it wasn't until I started doing the. Muay Thai kickboxing, where it was just like it was just assumed that you're going to stay in front of the person. So I'll, you know, okay, I'm going to stay in front of this person, and I, you know, bottom line is I have a hard head, I, you know, and a, and a nose that nose that, have any nose that can't can't be broken. Yeah. Uh, so I was, you know, I pick, I picked the right profession in that in that particular sense. Yeah, as opposed to me, got the European nose, and when I get hit, all this stuff, eyes water, and I can't see. So I'd be in big trouble if I got hit in the nose, which is, I did like, I did like football, and I, I still like it. I just think it doesn't make sense to have um, blows after blows. For example, Nick Bonaconti from uh, the Miami Dolphins and had a successful business career as, a, as an athletic agent afterwards, and then had his son became a paraplegic playing football in Florida. He estimates, he died uh, this year, as a matter of fact, he had a degrading dementia of his brain and other uh, health issues related to brain injuries in football. He estimates that from the time he was a peewee in football until the time he retired from the NFL, he had 10 or 200,000 hard contacts with his head. Because if you add up all of his, his uh, offensive lineman, defensive lineman skills as a kid and all the way, you're hitting in practice over and over. You're hitting the sled. You're go, go, go. And another gentleman I, I spoke to that grew up playing football, he said his friends that, that were hardcore football players, they said if you didn't see stars three times per practice and three times per game, it was a rarity. 
Yeah, no, I can see that. You know, there, there's something to be said about getting hit. Um, I know this is going to sound uh, silly, um, but a few weeks ago, uh, I don't I don't spar that much anymore. But a few weeks ago, I thought I uh, um, joined in with the with the, uh, the young, and young, young, young and hungry, the young, hungry yeah, guys. The young, we have one uh, uh, pro on the team, and um, you know he's bigger than everybody else. And I'm not as big as I used to be, but I went uh, you know toe to toe to toe with him, and then everybody's going. You guys were going going so hard, and um, getting hit when you you're, when you're used to getting hit is uh, this is going to sound completely mm -hmm. weird, mm -hmm. but it's like drinking. Yeah. It's like you get you, used to it. You can you can get used to it. You're Tolerance. drinking. You you feel a little bit you, you feel a little bit numb. You're kind of you're, you're kind of fine with it. Um, you don't you're not feeling that much pain because I yeah. you know uh, later on I text him I said um, yeah you must have hit me with something because my jaw hurts. And uh, but you just head gears huh head no, gears no head no, gears. The the thing the reason why we don't wear headgear is because the headgear is kind of a Oh, they're wearing headgear, therefore we get to hit harder. Uh, and we don't want them hitting, uh, hitting any harder. It, ch it changes off your timing, it yeah. changes off your distance. Yeah. If there's a, if there's somebody needs to get used to getting hit, we'll throw the headgear in on them. Um, we don't want them to get cut. That's what the head yeah. good what the headgear I mean, is good for. But I mean, and honestly, it's n it's not going to stop the yeah. uh, punches from from hurting you. So the most fragile organ of the human body. And so how do you take advice? So. I'm, uh, you know, gray-haired individual, age 56 right now. Yeah, I, I got a few gray. You got a few grays. Are, are you are there. you 50 yet? He is 50. Yeah. <laughs> you can take a look at that. Holy shite, you're 50. Yeah. So he turned 50. Happy birthday, Sifu. Um, I missed it by a month. I missed it by a month. But by a month. Uh, I'm there in spirit. Okay. Um, so, you know, taking advice. He was my Sifu, but if he was only 18 when he was my, still is my Sifu. But is he? If he was only 18. When he was my Sifu, because I did have one, my first take one though, Sifu was a, an 18 year old individual who'd been coaching since he was 10. He was a, he grew up in a martial arts family, and he, so he was coaching kids when he was 10, and he coached adults when he was 14 or 15. He matured early, and he was a man of very few words, and he was a good person for me to listen to, and I'll give you the best advice he ever gave me. I was going through stress from a relationship breakup one time. And I said, hey, what, do you, what should I do? And he goes, you know, I always feel better after a good workout. <laughs> One sentence. Mm. And that's what I did. And I, and I just, you know, I'm Sifu Slim, a fitness guy, fitness coach, and wellness and lifestyle coach. But when I do my workout every day in the morning, I have a very good chance, even if there's crazy stress and chaos happening in the world, I do very well at taking a nap and sleeping. And according to Ayurvedic medicine and other medicine, sleep is the you know improper or too much or inadequate sleep is the reason why we can't handle our stress. That's one of the main things they look for. So, my workouts and getting everything out, as it were, catharsis is the reason I can sleep really well. And uh, do you sleep well? I sleep really well. Every once in a while, I'll have a you know maybe once a month I might have something. Maybe every other month. But in general, you used to sleep less, and you used to have a night job because you didn't sleep. At yeah, night, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten years. I ago. changed my diet. Changed my diet. I went very, I went a lot more raw foods. Um, I don't eat that much, that that many carbohydrates. Everything's very well balanced. 